So Ed captured exactly um, what I am going to talk about. Uh, our science has moved very slowly because we, all of us, have taken on a worthy but very difficult problem. And the, the theme here will not be to tell you only one story, although I'll keep coming back to schizophrenia. But the theme is that new technologies, new tools, have put, I think, a new era in front of us. And the question really is, how will we as a field prepare ourselves? Now, the basic assumptions that I have, that I've always had, are to, that it's important to ground the practice of psychiatry in neuroscience. Now, I don't mean that exclusively. That does not mean uh, to the exclusion of thinking about lived experience or, uh, or the role of uh, all kinds of environments, whether more physical or more social. Uh, but the brain, in the end, is the great integrator. And it integrates both bottom-up influences from our genes, but also our lived experience. And when uh, sometimes, as is unfortunately the case in our field, and many of the, even the young people have probably experienced it, there's this uh, cognitive dissonance between people talking about uh, the brain and people talking about lived experience. Um, the, the, the interesting question as human beings is uh, not, you know, how to partition things between biology uh, and psychology or uh, the environment, but rather how the environment gets under the skin, how it, uh, how it changes us, how it influences mental illness and its treatment. Now, I have another assumption, having been at this, trying to teach neuroscience and psychiatry for decades, uh, that all of you young people are very busy learning all kinds of things. And uh, your patient experiences are incredibly salient and often, frankly, quite stressful. At least they were to me um, back in the last century. Uh, and we can't expect either you or busy practitioners to learn arcana just because it's cool, or you might learn it, but you won't remember it, just because it's cool and potentially interesting. I think it, it's really important that we uh, make sure that we try to connect what we're learning uh, without hype uh, to clinical utility, and that's not always so easy. So the practice of psychopharmacology, for example, uh, is, is really empirical. Right? And in fact, the truth is most, most of what you probably still get taught about how these drugs work uh, isn't all that satisfying. What we, what we understand is hazy. I mean, we know what these drugs bind to in the, in the brain, and we know the first few molecular interactions. But if you ask how a tricyclic drug or an SSRI actually takes somebody from sadness and disability to a healthy place, we can't, we can't answer that. And so I, I think we, as we think about this science, we have to think about how we apply it without overclaiming, but we absolutely have to connect it to utility. Uh, neuroimaging, I think, you know, is this amazing uh, technology. It's very, very important. But again, um, you know, I, I I mean, maybe, maybe I'm here being too critical, but I don't think there is a paper I've ever read uh, that uh, tells me what's going on in the brain in bipolar disorder or in major depression based on the, the kind of imaging technologies we have. Now, the technologies are getting better. The analyses are getting better. Tech images are getting multimodal. But what I'm, I'm not here to advertise neuroscience just because it's a cool thing and will make us feel greater dignity when we talk to um, people who work on other unpaired midline organs like cardiologists. Um, but, but we have to connect what we're learning to the clinical situation. And then I think uh, neuroscience uh, will be uh, important to all of us. Now, uh, my, the optimistic point here is that, uh, and I think you already heard it, I think you heard some of it in uh, some of the talks today, in, in Thalia's talk about polygenic risk scores, there, there is emerging science, not just neuroscience per se, but genetics, other areas of science, that will 
in the next few years of your careers will make, potentially make a difference to you if all of us are wise enough to deploy it in a good way. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the sort of the confession that there have been many false dawns, right? How many times have we heard that, you know, SNRIs were going to be better than SSRIs because they flipped the norepinephrine switch as well? Well, the truth is that all of the drugs we commonly use, and even, you know, the potentially, I think, new and useful drug for uh, depression, ketamine, were all discovered by serendipitous observation of, of ill humans, not from any theory. In fact, it's interesting. The only theory-driven treatment we have is CBT, and that truly originated in the 1960s with Beck and others based on uh, an understanding of the relationship between cognition and mood and emotion. Everything else um, was discovered serendipitously, uh, I'm going to tell you how I think we're going to do better, right? But, but I think we have to be very clear-eyed. And in fact, um, all of the molecular targets of these drugs, that is the first <coughs> molecules they bind when they enter the nervous system, uh, are the same as those of the 1950s prototypes, uh, except, of course, for lithium, which is older uh, and where we're not really certain of the molecular target. All right, why so slow? Um, well. We've, you, we've taken on very hard problems. Um, the human brain is inviolable in life. You know, cancer is a hard problem, but it's a much easier hard problem. Um, so, you know, a surgeon does a resection and hands the disease, literally the disease, to the investigator, right? And they can stick it in a nude mouse and fool themselves fool themselves because things grow faster in a nude mouse, faster metabolism, no immune system. Um, they can grow it in culture. Uh, we don't have access to tissue, right? I mean, the Incas did. They had this uh, procedure, which was, we can't find any evidence that it was ever subjected to good double-blind trials, like you heard from Bill Deacon. Uh, but this was trephination, and it, it, it was theoretically driven in the sense that it would have let a putative evil spirits exit the brain. Um, but, but look, I mean, we, we can sometimes get, we sometimes get, you know, healthy human brain tissue from epilepsy surgery, right, the overlying temporal cortex, but we, we can't do what the cancer surgeons do. And of course, you know that that wouldn't even help, right, because the symptoms of depression, the symptoms of schizophrenia are due to malfunctions in widely distributed circuits, right, and there are an unknown number of cell types in the brain. Although it's, it's great, we're learning. I mean, there are these single cell methods and there are these international brain projects that are gonna give us um, something that sounds boring, but it's really critical, which is a catalog of the thousand or 5,000 types of neurons and glia in the brain uh, and, and how they're connected up and the functions of that connectivity. It'll take a few years. So we don't have that. And in the diseases we have chosen to study, uh, at least, I mean, um, psychiatrists do see Alzheimer's patients when they have behavioral difficulties, but, you know, these core developmental illnesses that we've been talking about this morning, um, there, there isn't, you know, when you look post-mortem, you can learn important things, but you don't see dispositive uh, biochemical pathology the way you do in Alzheimer's, where people find A beta and tau and get all kinds of molecular clues to pathogenesis. Look, rodent models are, we're, we can't do without them. They're absolutely critical for basic science. If, if I discover a new gene and I want to know approximately what it does, I make a transgenic mouse, I knock it out, I knock it in. But um, th these, we've been fooling ourselves. These are not translational models, right? Or to put it another way, it's, there's never been a better time to be a mouse with Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> but the 90 million years in evolution isn't only time for divergence, there are somewhat different selection pressures on rodents and primates, right? They have ended up only modestly social, nocturnal, olfactory, and primates are highly social. Much of our brain evolution was driven by our social interactions. We're diurnal and we're visual. So why would we think that, uh, we, could, that we could truly model psychiatric disorders uh, in a rodent, uh, it's led us astray. Um, and then, of course, uh, 
and again, I think that genetics is going to help us, but genetics is only probabilistic with our diseases, so it's not going to be the answer key. But we've got to get, we've got to, and you heard, again, a, a number of speakers this morning really touched on this. We, we don't have categories, right? The, the, our, our, you know, um, five of nine for two weeks is not the threshold of major depression, right? Um, and, 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 and this has been hampering us. If you do an imaging study and you're forced to use the DSM criteria, um, you're hamstrung, right? Because the, they pick out heterogeneous chimeric groups of patients. It would be much better to let you define your own patient grouping and describe it very, very well than to have to rely on these kinds of fictive criterion sets. So what, what, what is all of this? What am I saying? Well, what we haven't had in psychiatry, because we don't have access to all these things, is the, a ground truth, right? Instead, we rely on animal models because, you know, if, if, a, if a rodent were depressed, it would not struggle when we throw it in cold water. Well, you know, not so sure. We need a ground truth. And, and what's really exciting is that genetics, without overselling it, gives us that promise. So mental disorders are significantly genetically influenced. Uh, as has been said by everyone today correctly, genes are not fate, uh, but the, the heritabilities are substantial enough, and for schizophrenia, autism, and bipolar disorder, they're really pretty high, to tell us that our genomes harbor secrets, if we can read them, that will give us molecular mechanisms that underlie causation. Now, genetics is also privileged, germline genetics is also privileged in another way. You are correctly taught, and I hope you always remember, that correlations are not causes. But there's something about your germline DNA sequences, which is that they're there ab initio. They're there from the point of fertilization, prior to any developmental process, any environmental influence. And therefore, any rigorously determined association, and I mean, you know, you want real statistical certainty, um, is telling you that, that Whatever that piece of DNA is, and it's often initially until we figure out more, not a gene, it's just a chunk of DNA, it, it has something to do with the causal processes, the molecular mechanisms underlying whatever trait you're studying, whether it's a normal trait like adult height uh, or, or some form of psychopathology. Now, we have to be careful. Uh, 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 this next point sort of argues that these really are clues to causality, but sometimes they're very indirect. So a big GWAS, genome-wide association study, uh, was done in lung cancer. And, you know, much of cancer have to do with environmentally caused somatic mutations, especially lung cancer. Uh, so the genes that came out of this first trial were two genes that encode uh, nicotinic receptors, um, the, the, the alpha subunits five and six, which were known to be risk factors for smoking. So, um, so the kind of causation that the, the um, investigators were looking at were things that had to do with cell cycle or some form of um, oncogenesis, but what they found was actually causal just at a distance, or you could say it was residual confounding, right? They couldn't get a population of people with lung cancer who weren't also smokers. Uh, but so always, always a warning, but, but very useful. All other processes are, are important, right? Epigenetics is going to turn out to be important. The trouble with epigenetics, of course, is it's cell type specific, and we don't have access um, to, to brains. And so people hope that white cells will somehow mimic what's going on in the brain. But the whole point of um, epigenetics is to distinguish your cell type. So I'm not sure how they think they're doing that. Uh, but, um, but all of these other biological processes, which are downstream, could be causal, but they could also be the result of the disease, the result of treatment and adaptation to the disease. So it, that's why it's worth doing genetics. It's to, it's, it's to have some, even a probabilistic partial ground truth. All right, so our, our genomes, we have uh, high heritabilities, autism, schizophrenia, bipolar, 80% of the variants, according to twin studies, uh, may be explained by genes. Uh, much less for major depression and anxiety disorders, at most 35 percent, so uh, non-genetic factors uh, are clearly more important. But for years, 
in the 1990s, early 2000s, people tried to actually say, well, which genes, which pieces of DNA? And the methods that succeeded for monogenic disorders, things like Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis, uh, failed for psychiatry. And people, in the end, did really rigorous, well-powered studies, and it didn't work. And so the hypothesis underlying these early methods, and I'm not going to diagram them in detail, were that there would be genes of large effect segregating in families. And I think they really falsified that hypothesis. Um, and, and the problem was that we didn't have the technologies initially to identify um, genes of small effect. So one of the things, if I think about what psychiatrists, actually all physicians and all physician scientists should learn, is quantitative genetics, right? So I, we all learn about Mendel, right? Here he is, um, dour-looking Austrian monk. Uh, and Mendel um, studied traits of pea plants that were caused by single genetic loci, dominant and um, recessive, um, you know, pink versus white, pink is dominant over white. And he was a genius because what he did is he carefully ignored everything he didn't understand. Now, um, all of the traits we care about, with some few exceptions, are not monogenic, right? Cognition, emotional control, behavioral regulation, liability to depression, liability to schizophrenia. Uh, these are quantitative traits. Well, uh, we, we uh, th and, and by the way, this argument, uh, a lot of which happened here in Cambridge at, at, around the turn of the 19th to 20th centuries, uh, how did you? How, how did? You, how could you have quantitative traits uh, and also uh, be a Mendelian? Well, it turns out, you know, that R. A. Fisher, by 1918, had figured out that as long as the Mendelian units, which turned out to be genes, right, had a small effect, traits could be constructed of many, many units, and then you could explain uh, quantitative genetics. Uh, but it means for us, right, that there is no gene for schizophrenia, there's no gene for psychopathy, right? Uh, and in fact, what we've learned is there, there aren't even scores of genes. There are many hundreds of genes. Maybe 5% or 10% of our genomes are involved uh, in these disorders. And a tiny little tweak in, in one of the thousand genes, let's say, that or so it might turn out in the end to be associated with schizophrenia, pushes you a little farther away or a little closer, uh, but none of them makes a giant splash. And of course, that raises uh, really important challenges for us. Now, um, technology has come to the rescue in some sense, right? So um, uh, Thalia talked to you about, uh, you, in fact, you've seen a number of Manhattan plots already today and GWAS. Um, Basically, th that data is based on microarrays or gene chips, um, usually spotted with a million um, DNA sequences that basically mark the entire genome. And the reason we have that is has to do with human population history. This is a very brief excursus, but uh, I think it helps explain it. So um, humans percolated along for, you know, uh, it, the, the dates are very much in contention, but let's guess a million years, um, and modern humans maybe for many hundreds of thousands of years, and we had a population of maybe some tens of millions. That was our primate phase, and then came the Neolithic Revolution, and then the Industrial Revolution, uh, and, uh, and now in uh, about 10 or 12 generations, we have almost 8 billion people on Earth. During this long period, there was time for cleansing natural selection. And, and most of us actually, although different populations, whether our ancestors came from um, different parts of Africa or Asia or Europe, uh, we might have different allele frequencies, but most of us actually have the same uh, variants. Humans are very closely related to each other. And because of that, we can array them on a chip. But there's been no time for cleansing natural selection here. And so there's no way we could have a million markers that picks up everything. So here we have to do DNA sequencing. What's really great about these chips for future psychiatry research, whatever we're going to use them for, is it costs about $40 or $50 a person. So for a, a very advanced uh, test, uh, that's, that, that lets you study lots and lots and lots of people. 
course, we still have to talk about what it's good for, and that's the expensive sequencing machine for modern variation. Okay, so you've seen a Manhattan plot already, chromosome one out to uh, the sex chromosomes, and this is, uh, I, I have to confess, I, I, I didn't like having, seeing on somebody's slides two lines, you know, um, we should be so rigorous, we don't want to fool ourselves, because each, each of these genes that we want to study, uh, I measure in postdoc lives or graduate student lives, um, and lots of money, and I, I don't want them working on the wrong thing because I hope that it was true. So this is the, the minimal line of, um, of significance, which you've already heard, is uh, the equivalent to P less than 0.05 uh, corrected for a million comparisons, but actually this, this, uh, this peak, um, which Bill Deacon mentioned in the MHC locus, uh, which is mostly complement factor C4, now is at 10 to the minus 53. So you can safely work on that. That's not going away. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is a really polygenic disease. So this is uh, the other thing that was mentioned, which is really important. The only way this work can get done is by large global collaborations, right? So the, the, uh, the head of the uh, schizophrenia working group for the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, Mick O'Donovan, is it, uh, uh, in Cardiff and... Mark Daly is with us in the Broad, and Stefan Ripke is in Berlin, and, we, and people have put together lots and lots and lots of cohorts, and uh, this, is, uh, this is not yet published, but well out of date. There are now about 100, 000, almost 100,000 schizophrenia cases and about 280 um, uh, genome-wide significant loci, uh, but Stefan showed me this. This is the rate of discovery for schizophrenia. There's no slowing. So uh, this is where we're, we're guessing, you know, maybe a thousand genes, uh, although it's really a very, very, very vague guess. But the other thing that really matters, and, and this, uh, I'm afraid, oh, I'm trying to go backwards here. Um, I'm afraid that this is why even young psychiatrists who you might think you have escaped statistics, um, I think it's really important is that the average effect size of any one of these peaks is 1.08, right? That is, if you have the, the, the risk version of any one of these uh, loci, your, your chance of having schizophrenia increases by 8%, right? That's not a lot. And so uh, we have to be very, very careful that we don't overinterpret these things. And we have a lot of hard work in figuring out how we're going to advance uh, to biology. And of course, for rare variants, we do uh, DNA sequencing because um, there, we, we couldn't capture all of human diversity. We often see ultra, ultra rares that may occur you know, only in one family, or they may be private mutations. Uh, now, one advantage, though, of, of this kind of analysis is because these have not gone through cleansing natural selection you can find some um, genetic variants, uh, recent mutations that have a somewhat higher effect size for uh, psychiatric disorders. But rare variants are rare. So the, re the gene chips work, even though these are genes of small effect, they're common in the population. Allele frequencies are usually above 5%. These are both generally of small effect and very rare. So um, again, with a consortium at 25,000 cases, uh, only three genes are genome-wide significant for changes in protein coding regions that are considered to be rare variants. Um, so I'm, I'm not, and that may not have made sense to you, but I'm not going to, I ju just wanna point out the challenges. And, and, but this is what's interesting about psychiatric disorders. So it turns out most human diseases are polygenic like this, but for diseases that uh, don't affect reproductive fitness, there are also some really big, potent alleles. Uh, so in Alzheimer's disease, there's ApoE4, which has an, a huge influence on risk. In cardiovascular medicine, there are some alleles that that have a large effect on risk, and it's much easier to do biology on those than a gene version that might 
change your likelihood of having a condition by 8% or 5% or 2%. So here's the thing about our disease. We, we seem not to have any of these in psychiatry. Well, uh, if you look at, uh, these, these are fecundity studies that have been done. Uh, I think this one was done in Sweden, but they've been done in a number of Scandinavian countries. If you compare the number of children a male or a female has who has schizophrenia or autism uh, with their unaffected siblings, uh, they will have, the males will have about a quarter as many children and the females about half as many children. And even, interestingly, for bipolar disorder, where, you know, uh, as, as, a, uh, uh, as a young psychiatrist, I would have thought that my patients were out fecundating, you know, uh, or, or, or so it seemed. In fact, they also have reduced fecundity because uh, they can't necessarily get it together to have the kind of uh, stable relationships that might lead to, uh, to children. Um, now, it's not, you know, uh, it's not true for all of our disorders, but there is an evolutionary price that's paid for having one of these behavioral disorders. And uh, it means that any allele, any version of a gene that really increases your risk of, especially of schizophrenia, autism, or any of the psychotic disorders, is very quickly washed out of the gene pool because those people don't have children. The, the alleles of small effect are just under the radar because in most combinations they're neutral. And in some combinations they may even be beneficial. So it's only in these infelicitous combinations plus bad luck in development plus some environmental second hit that they produce the disease. But if you had a really high penetrance allele, um, it, it would give you these disorders and it wouldn't last. Okay, I'm going to... Okay. Well, you've heard about polygenic risk scores, so I'm going to go very, very quickly. Uh, but the basis is really to take uh, whatever disease you're interested in and, and uh, take the largest meta-analysis, you know, the best data, and then uh, calculate a, a weighted sum, weighted for effect size uh, across the entire genome, weighted for meaning you know, does it increase risk by 1.10 fold or 1.02 fold, right? That's the weighting. Um, and then you can get a, it's really important, a probabilistic, I, these are already being misused as if they are a blood test or something. These are probabilistic and, and the probability for each disorder, right? This is a common variant analysis on a gene chip. So it depends, it, it matches out in your ethnic group as to what percentage of the variance is explained by common variance, okay? So the maximum heritability of major depression is 35%. And let's say depression is mostly common variance, not new mutations. Uh, it still gives you a maximum, right? So these are going to be probabilistic um, as, as measures. Um, and, but uh, on the other hand, you know, for schizophrenia where about half of the variance is explained by common variance. Already in uh, European populations, in studies done by several Scandinavian epidemiologists, you can explain 30% of the variance of schizophrenia risk with this, with this gene chip. So that's, that's pretty good. You know, uh, we're, in cardiovascular medicine, people are used to having many factors to explain risk, right? And actually they're now adding uh, a polygenic risk score for people um, who have myocardial infarctions even if they don't smoke and their lipids are healthy and so forth uh, because there is added risk. But you add that to smoking behavior, to LDL cholesterol, to blood pressure, and you get a pretty good uh, risk score. We clearly, this, this is for us the beginnings, but at least for psychosis, I think people have some other really reasonable ideas about what other uh, types of risk might be factored in. Now, one utilization of polygenic risk scores, um, before we even get to uh, the biology of any of these genes, is they allow us to ask how they intersect across psychiatric diseases or any phenotype. It turns out that across all of medicine, there's a lot of sharing of risk alleles and also unshared. So in inflammatory bowel disease, you know, there's uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, they have shared and unshared alleles. A few unlucky folk have uh, too many shared alleles and they'll have um, surgery to cure them of ulcerative colitis and then they'll end up having Crohn's disease. But for the most part, people have 
uh, one or the other. Uh, for us, you know, we can ask whether, you know, what, what, uh, what other conditions share risk alleles with anxiety disorders, um, and, you know, we can, we can see that uh, MDD, uh, in fact, you know, MDD probably shares about 70% of the common variance with, with anxiety disorders. Um, that major depressive disorder, or for anorexia nervosa, there are shared risk alleles with OCD. Um, so as we start to understand for the biology, you know, uh, it means that if I'm studying OCD and I want to understand the biology of these risk alleles, it's really useful for me to know that these risk alleles, some of them are also involved in anorexia nervosa because I don't want to get, I don't want to have phenotype blindness, right? Looking where the light shines, studying thinking if genes are associated with the disease I work on, uh, this is in BioArchive, by the way. Um, it, it's, I think it's in review in, a, in another journal. Um, um, you know, I, I, it, genes are pleiotrophic. They do lots and lots of things, and if we're going to really understand what they do, this is very helpful. It also tells us that this is just a mess, right? It explains the fact that schizophrenia and bipolar share 70 percent of their common alleles. It doesn't make them the same disease, but it explains why our patients never seem to have read and memorized either this or uh, Kraepelin's textbook, right? How many times have the young psychiatrists, you know, you've seen a patient, you can't tell what the diagnosis is. Or they had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, but right now to you they look schizoaffective or even bipolar at a different time in their lives. Um, we, have, we need a much more dimensional approach, and we have to permit uh, changes in trajectory over time. And this kind of data really undercuts uh, the, 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 the really the original sin of, of this book, I mean, it has many, but I think is the categorical idea uh, that, we, that our diseases were, were uh, like more like smallpox than like diabetes. Right, you have it or you don't. Okay, so now the problem for uh, me as a biologist, though, is how do I even analyze, um, uh, you know, all of these alleles of small effect, or how do my colleagues and I? So... I'm just going to be really uh, go through this very, very quickly, but a really key concept is one of convergence, right? Which is, um, you know, in the end, the way biology works, we pray at least, is that, you know, there are just a finite number of um, signaling pathways in neurons in the brain, uh, molecular complexes involved in synaptic function. Uh, are, are very varied and complicated, but, um, but, but are also finite. There may be several thousand different cell types, but uh, perhaps schizophrenia comes down to uh, one or a few that are mostly affected. And so we can uh, look at, for example, and I'm going to show you this first, and this, this is very much, oh, I, I did it in, a, in I, I went in a different order. Just forgive me, I'm going to, um, we, we, can, we can take something like the equivalent conceptually of a polygenic risk score, right, and ask instead of, for this person's phenotype, you know, what, what are the collection of risk alleles that they, they have in their genomes, and we can ask for a cell type, uh, what, uh, for this cell, if we look at all the genes expressed in that cell, uh, what, um, uh, how, what is the overlap with the GWAS, with the risk genes for schizophrenia, or the risk genes for bipolar disorder? Now, to do that, we have to be able to not grind the brain up and mix all of the thousands of cell types, but study each of the cell types individually and ask what genes are expressed in those cells. Um, and that can be done now because there are these really cool technologies. Uh, my, my colleagues, uh, Steve McCarroll and Evan, Evan McCosco, oops, See if I can. I'm trying to show you this little movie of the droplets, but if I, I'm a Mac person and very. Oh, here it is. So basically, you you tease apart the cells of a brain. You have molecular barcodes and cells which you might see every once in a while entering here. 
get mixed with a molecular barcode and various buffers, and they're locked inside an oil droplet. They get lysed, and the, all of the RNAs in the cell get sequenced. Uh, and so um, then you can take uh, this signature of all the genes expressed in those cells, and this is very primitive. This is, uh, just came out this week from Hillary Finucane and Nature Genetics, uh, and, and project the risk genes from a GWAS uh, on top of all of the cell types. And we're starting, we're just starting to get some useful information. So it looks like the risk genes in schizophrenia tend to be uh, expressed in glutamatergic neurons. And this is in agreement with lots of other things which have implicated upper la layer uh, cortical pyramidal cells in schizophrenia. Bipolar disorder seems to be more of the GWAS genes, it's early days, the GWAS is still small, are expressed in GABAergic neurons. In Alzheimer's disease, not up here, um, uh, a third of the genes that have been found are expressed in microglia, which suggests that processes you heard about earlier today having to do with maybe uh, synaptic removal uh, relate to the cognitive problems in, um, in, in Alzheimer's disease. So this is going to just get better and better, but it gives you, again, some notion of how this genetic information relates to neurobiology and ultimately, if we're going to target the particular cell types, will relate to hopefully clinical practice. Um, I, I want to, um, I was always, I always get a little bit too ambitious. Um, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about um, what you heard about from Bill Deacon um, uh, at a more basic level here about um, uh, how these genomic discoveries really do point us toward certain biological processes. In this case, it's, um, it's synaptic uh, pruning. So, um, so we, we, um, we know that schizophrenia has had certain interesting anatomic observations associated with it for many years. So uh, this is uh, uh, from Ty Cannon, but there have been a number of studies showing that as people develop schizophrenia through a first episode, um, they have greater cortical thinning of their prefrontal cortex than normally developing young people, okay? Um, and then there have been famous studies from uh, David Lewis's group looking post-mortem at and arguing that people with schizophrenia uh, have excessive cortical thinning, not because of cell death, but because of loss of processes. And, uh, and David, um, you know, compared a, quote, healthy uh, control, and there are all of these, these are dendrites and these are dendritic spines, and synapses sit at the heads of these dendritic spines, and here's somebody with schizophrenia. Now, today, as we demand greater rigor, we would say, um, how did you select these dendrites? To, I know David well, but, you know, how did you select these dendrites for analysis? And let's see the quantitation. And uh, this is so potentially subjective. Has another lab done the same experiment? gotten tissue from you blinded. So I don't think we actually know this, but uh, uh, even though it's classic uh, and it fits uh, everything we want to believe, um, but I think we would uh, probably do better today, or at least we, we would know we would do better today, which is take nothing away from this really superb science. It's just this question of how we know what we know and how certain are we is really important. Now, the reason that these are interesting in schizophrenia ties to an observation that was made in the 1970s by Hutton Locker at the University of Chicago, which is he looked at, uh, he did Golgi stains uh, on post-mortem tissue from people who died in uh, different stages of childhood, and he found that we had uh, our largest number of synapses um, uh, sort of late childhood, early adolescence, and that uh, our synapses are pruned as we get older. And uh, there are lots of stories mostly rooted in primary sensory cortex, Hubel and Weasel's work in visual cortex. But it basically says, look, you're born into a world, evolution couldn't know exactly what synapses you would need because it wouldn't know what world you were in, right? And it wouldn't even know how far apart your eyes were, right? Because, you know, your nose, you know, does its own thing. 
uh, and to have binocular vision, uh, you, you have to prune the synapses in your primary, in your thalamus primary visual cortex. Um, so children um, are very creative and very flexible, uh, but uh, eventually to be an adult, uh, you need to have a much more efficient brain, a much more automatic brain, um, and, uh, and we all know that we can learn a new language much more easily when we're young than when we're old. Uh, and we heard about adult learning and how pathetic we are uh, just before lunch. Um, uh, but on the other hand, our brains are really efficient. And they're not only efficient, but they process differently. We have juvenile justice systems versus adult because the moral cognition of young people is very different from the moral cognition um, of, of adults. Um, so uh, the, the idea is that synapses you don't use, weak synapses get pruned away. And as Carla Schatz has said, neurons that fire together wire together that as strong synapses are, um, are maintained and even, even strengthened. And of course, learning is all about manipulating synaptic weights, uh, sometimes pruning synapses that are no longer needed, strengthening others, building others. So what was uh, noticed is uh, first in the 1980s by a sleep physiologist at UC San Francisco named Erwin Feinberg is that the, the trajectory of onset of schizophrenia matched this pattern of pruning, and he could see it because he was a sleep physiologist by the changing EEG power uh, in his scalp electrodes. Um, and th the theory was this. Look, in early adolescence, people who go on to have schizophrenia begin to have cognitive decline. And usually we don't pick it up because there are lots of pe reasons why kids, for example, are not doing so well in school. But we begin to have cognitive decline and then deficit symptoms and then sometimes later psychosis. Uh, and um, and if, we were, if you were over pruning, if you were losing too many synapses, like a person with Alzheimer's disease, if you were losing too many synapses in uh, the prefrontal cortex, right, as, as you see from the Ty Cannon slide, you might expect that working memory uh, would be impaired as it is in schizophrenia. So this was this, he, he developed this inappropriate and excessive pruning hypothesis which was immediately ignored and remained ignored. And then, just completely independently, um, Ben Barris, the, the, the recently tra uh, prematurely deceased Ben Barris had pancreatic cancer at Stanford, and his postdoc, who is now my colleague, Beth Stevens, did, an, did a, uh, a, a, just a, unbiased screen looking for the eat me signals on weak synapses because somehow the synapses have to get pruned away and the cell that um, eats weak synapses as you've already heard today are microglia. Uh, in the interest of time I didn't bring videos but microglia, there are a lot of microglia in your brains and microglia have these processes, they touch every synapse in your brain about every two hours and if they don't smell right, they're gone. Um, and to their surprise, they found that the classic complement pathway was a critical, maybe the critical eat me signal. There's also probably a don't eat me signal, CD47. You know, things are never quite as uh, reductively simple as that. But, but, um, but, um, but basically what happens is um, uh, weak synapses start displaying for whatever, for reasons we still don't understand the molecular mechanisms, uh, complement factor C3, and when the microglia comes by now, it just picks off that synapse. Now in the periphery, complements at a much higher concentration, and it's used to opsonize and, and cause engulfment of whole cells, right? Uh, bacteria, uh, cells that are dying, uh, but here it's at a lower concentration, it's just picking off individual synapses. And um, I've already said that uh, we shouldn't think of mice as models of human psychiatric disease. That's a step too far, but they're great for basic science. And so Beth and her colleagues knocked C4 out in a, in a mouse and uh, saw that in the heterozygote, but more in the knockout, there was you know, under pruning of, of lots of synapses. A great use of mice, right? A general biological principle. And now there's an overexpressor that overprunes. 
And then to break my heart, when they sent the paper for review, one of the reviewers asked whether the mice had symptoms of schizophrenia. And, and I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know what to do, right? Uh, but, uh, but you guys are going to be smarter than that. So uh, that, you know, uh, Max Planck once said, science progresses one funeral at a time. And, uh, and, you know, maybe he was not wrong. He was talking about the acceptance of quantum mechanics. But I think for our field, there are some things that are going to be that difficult. Okay, so, so here's the idea that, uh, oh, I, I didn't show you the key in my exuberance, this key slide. So this, the MHC peak, actually, in, uh, it's, it's largest in European. So we've got, we got to understand that this, we don't have all the answers yet. It's got three signals, but there's a huge signal at complement protein, complement factor C4. And uh, um, what Steve McCarroll, and, and there are many different flavors of, of the C4 gene. And what Steve McCarroll and an intrepid graduate student, Ashwin Sekar, showed is that uh, if you have the lowest risk allele, um, uh, you know, this would be, they set this as, as a risk of one for schizophrenia two, three, and the highest risk allele gives you a whopping 1.3-fold risk. This is actually the biggest genetic risk factor for schizophrenia among common, uh, uh, common alleles. Now, so it doesn't explain all of schizophrenia, right? What does it do? It points us to a biological process. It says, okay, guys, investigate pruning or investigate whatever complement is doing, right? Because an allele, whatever its effect size, is a finding tool. What it's doing is it's telling you that the gene that it's associated with is important. And, and then the directionality is important. This one is saying if this gene is overactive, it, it nudges people towards schizophrenia. So it tells people they're probably, you look for other genes involved in pruning, right? Um, and look for other parts of this process. But even in postmortem brains, uh, looking at, at C4, now there's a big overlap. Again, this is polygenic, right? This isn't simply uh, reductive and causal. People with schizophrenia tend to have higher levels of C4 than C3, but there are, uh, than, than controls, but there are lots of outliers. So I'm going to wind up, um, but just by saying, but this isn't an answer. This is a question, right? So other people have said, are there other genes that regulate the complement pathway in the schizophrenia risk among schizophrenia risk alleles, lo and behold, not yet published, but pretty close. There's this gene CSMD1. Um, the S is because it has, I love the name, it has sushi domains. Um, it is a complement inhibitor. And people with schizophrenia have decreased activity of CSMD1. And uh, preliminarily, it looks like in a knockout mouse, you get under pruning. Um, uh, in a, yeah, knockout mouse, because it inhibits um, uh, complement. But there, and then a lot of other genes in schizophrenia have to do with the synapses, with synaptic strength. But we don't know yet at all how they relate to the potential of over pruning. So we have a lot of follow up. And then, you know, I was interested to hear uh, Bill's talk. I, I've been thinking, but then we have to bring this to the patients, to the humans, and when might this be happening really early? So uh, maybe we need serial CSF, maybe as a consortium, as a global consortium to get this. Uh, measures of, uh, uh, of uh, complement levels and maybe uh, synaptic, bits of synaptic proteins that the microglia have pooped out after they've gorged themselves into the CSF. You know, that's what, in Alzheimer's, the biomarkers are tau and, and, and A beta, right? So very, very analogous. We need better pet ligands, um, and not just to study, uh, you know, maybe the microglia don't become hyperactive. All they're doing is picking off a few extra synapses. Um, but we need, there, there are now pet ligands like SV2 to look at synaptic density. Maybe we need better ones. Maybe we need a, again, the, uh, you know, uh, we need, the trouble with this is you, we're looking at young people who don't have full-blown illness yet. But the goal, right, would be to intervene before they lose these synapses. Uh, we need st structural MRI. Uh, Ty Cannon claims he can see the excessive pruning of people who go on to have schizophrenia against the background of everybody pruning. Uh, 
Um, I'm not necessarily convinced, but I think MRI is going to be critical here, and careful serial cognitive testing. Maybe, be, and, and this, this gets to the, 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 the clinical applications, just maybe if we figure out how to follow up on this, if we're convinced that it's real, uh, as a community, uh, we might be able to uh, really have a good prediction of who might go on to have schizophrenia, and then we, maybe we could intervene before they have psychosis. I, I, I have the feeling that psychosis is just what happens when you don't have enough synapses and you start misprocessing, because people with Huntington's disease get psychosis, people with Alzheimer's disease get psychosis, and if you've ever uh, seen them clinically, um, uh, and you were just not to look at them and, and, and be biased by age, but listen to some of the delusions, they're not very different from somebody with schizophrenia. Uh, and in fact, the GWAS actually seems to correlate with the cognitive and deficit symptoms, not with, right, not, not with the psychosis. Um, would we want to mess with uh, adolescent synaptic pruning? Well, only if we had a really good biomarker, right? That's the point. And also, you might not have to do it for long. Maybe you had to do it for the three to five years of maximum synaptic pruning. I don't know, but it's really exciting, okay, that un unbiased genetics is giving us new biology that we didn't suspect. Uh, we have to be skeptical. We have to demand statistical rigor. We have to connect it to the neurobiology and to the clinical picture. And we, we definitely need clinicians as part of this, people who know the phenotypes and the patients and the trajectory. Um, and, and I, you know, I'm rather optimistic. I think these tools, when I see probabilities like for C4 of my, 10 to the minus 53, this is real. We just have to understand what it means. And we better not come to premature closure on it. And I think that's one of the critical lessons. So you should learn some genetics. You should learn neurobiology, but I think you really have to steep yourself in rigor and, 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 and become really critical owners of the literature of our field. Thank you very much.